And we're back, Mr. Bones. Hey, where's Mr. Bones? Mr. Bones? Guess who's back? Back again. Guess who's back? Tell your friends. Guess who's back? Guess who's back? Guess who's back? Guess who's back? Na 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 na. Na 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 na. Na 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 na. Na 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 na. Yo, this looks like the job for me, so everybody just follow me. We need Mr. Bones levity, cause it feels so empty without me. Yes, this looks like a job for me, this new wine controversy. So everybody, just follow me. It'll be made clear by Dr. B. Dr. B. And you're back, Mr. Bones. Where you been, old friend? Hey, what's going on? Uh, I was on sabbatical. Oh, very nice. Well, I, uh, I know it was a well-deserved rest. Oh, uh, Dr. Berry, I noticed while I was gone, your views kind of went down. Hey, Mr. Bones, you know, when you try to pander to the crowd, it's never a good thing. So, we're back, and it's us, and who wants to know when the rapture is? Uh, I do. So, uh, you know, this is a channel looking for the rapture, and we're going to speak our minds, and we're going to tell you what we think. We're going to tell you about God's plan, and we're going to tell you why we think... The rapture of his beloved church is coming up maybe August 13th. Say what? Yeah, that's right. August 13th, which falls in line with God's true Pentecost, the Feast of New Wine, which will be at the 8th of Av turning into the 9th of Av. And we have a lot to teach on that. So, uh, Mr. Bones, you know, since you've been gone, uh, maybe you want to give your two cents. Oh, well, uh, there's still some controversy, some new wine deniers. And so, Dr. Perry, could you just explain what the Bible says about it? Well, that's uh, always been our source, Mr. Bones. And um, I'm going to tell you, we have a, a way to cause a paradigm shift in you. You know, a paradigm shift is to, to uh, look at something you've always looked at, but now you are seeing it with new eyes, with a, with a new view, uh, maybe erasing some underlying assumptions. So, you know, we still get this uh, comment, Mr. Bones. I don't think it'll be on a Jewish feast day. <laughs> oh, brother, I know that one bothers you. Yeah, it does because uh, they're God's feast days, the feast of Yahweh that he had from the beginning. In fact, I made a little poster of God's plan. So if you'll give me a minute, I'll, I'll hang this up. Okay, good. All right, can you see us? I'm gonna have you zoom in just a little bit so they can uh, read it better. We all good? Okay, so this is Yahweh's plan before he created the earth, okay? Yahweh in heaven existed with the angels, but before he created the earth and the lower heavens, this was his plan from the beginning. And you can tell by his name already, yud Hey vav Hey, hand of grace, behold, nailed in grace, behold, that he had the plan from eternity. Okay, so this was God's plan before he created the earth. Now let me start out can you see this over here Shing! all right right up here at the top elohim then the angels and then would come mankind satan an angel a created being had aspirations to rise above elohim because of the pride of his heart he wanted to rise above elohim and be worshipped. Okay? Elohim had the plan of humbling himself. And as it says in Psalm 8, he was a little lower than the, he made him a little lower than the angels. Okay? Mankind below. So, Satan's plan, pride, rise above the glory of God. Our glorious Lord, his plan to humble himself. So the plan was Elohim is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. 
he would take off his supernatural of the Father and be emptied of the Holy Spirit and be delivered to earth as a seed of mankind into the virgin vessel Mary. And then to be born not only as a lowly man, but as a vulnerable baby, the very lowest. And then he would walk a perfect walk to fulfill his plan. So what was his plan? Again, from the beginning, he created mankind. This was after the angels and after Satan had fallen, been cast down. So he created mankind and he knew they, with a free will, would also fall. So when Adam and Eve fell by choosing to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which meant they make the choices of their law. They choose good and evil. So it was like choosing to be their own gods. And that's what Satan tempted them with. Oh, he's withholding from you. He knows you're not going to die. But if you eat like that, if you eat from that, you'll be like gods. You will know, have the knowledge, the secret knowledge. So by one man's offense, all have fallen. All are appointed to death because all came from that bloodline. So when Adam and Eve ate of that fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, the spirit of God left and they became body and soul. So man being body and soul, the first Adam was a living soul. The second Adam or last Adam would come being a quickening spirit. So the main goal was the salvation of mankind to restore the spirit to mankind. So here's Yahweh's plan. Again, before he even created the earth, before he created Adam, before he made the, the sun, moon, and stars, and the oceans, and the trees, I got to have to save mankind. And I will come, and as a man, without my supernatural God the Father, and without my supernatural Holy Spirit, indwelling. I will walk perfect. I will die innocent and I will pay with perfect blood. So this was God's plan of redemption, how to save mankind from utter doom, to buy us back when man fell, then we became the property of Satan. Satan lorded over us. And so redemption actually means to buy back from lawful captivity. So Satan owned us and owns everybody that's still not saved. And they are appointed to eternity with him in hell. But God had a plan to save mankind. Okay? Then, the next part of his plan, he was going to find a bride. And he would test hearts and he would harvest souls. So he would have this period of time of mankind where he could introduce himself and ask for those who would willfully choose him. Different than how he created the angels. Then he would, third part of his plan, offer the marriage cup of the covenant marriage union. He's going to offer the marriage cup, which, which was free will. If you drink it, you're saying I do. So he knew he was going to pay for mankind. He was going to find a bride, search out, and he was going to offer, if you will, follow me. And those that will, he said, if you drink this cup, then it's on. It's official. I will be your God and you will be my people. I will be your husband, and you will be my bride, and I will take care of you for eternity. That's the cup, a critical part. Then, after he had found his bride, he would sound the alarm of judgment. There would be a seven days of testing, and then there would be a judgment day. The final separation. So of all mankind that he offered the choice and those that drunk the cup and a final warning and a 
final examination. There's going to be a judgment day where there's a separation. All those that are with me on the Lord's side and all those that are against me on Satan's side. Then, after he made the separation, he would dwell among men and then he would bring new beginnings. So, many of you instantly saw in God's plans what his appointments were. Again, he said, I have these things to do. These are my appointments with mankind. I'm going to save them. I'm going to find a bride. I'm going to offer a cup for them to drink. They'll either drink it or they won't. I will sound an alarm. I'm going to put them through testing and give them another chance to drink that cup. I'm going to do a final judgment day and then I'll dwell among them and then we will have new beginnings. That was his plan. Then, Mr. Bones, guess what? After he had the plan, oh, he planned it all first. Then he created the earth. Then he created the heavens, the lower heavens, which is space, and then the heavens above us, and then earth, and the seas, and dry land, and the trees, and mankind, and all the animals. Okay? So now he created the earth, and he created the seasons of the year from spring to summer to fall to winter to go in a cycle. And he said, I'm going to have these things come forth at the beginning, like barley at the beginning of the year. And lambs will be bringing forth baby lambs at the beginning of the year. And then I'm going to have wheat to follow seven weeks after to fit with my plan. And then I'm going to have grapes to make wine to fit with my plan seven complete Sabbaths later, seven complete Sabbaths after the wheat, and then seven more complete Sabbaths. I'm going to sound the alarm and the seven days of testing, and there's going to be a judgment because at the final, I'm going to bring them all in and we are going to dwell together in a new beginning. So after he had the plan, Mr. Bones, I get it. So what did he do? What did he do? Yes. After he had the plan, he says, okay, these are my appointments with mankind. I know exactly when I'm going to do. Them. In fact, in fact, he said, I'm going to give him 6,000 years which is like six days for me because a day is like a thousand years. And on the fourth day at twilight, the 4,000th year, I'm going to come and do all my plan. I'm going to save mankind by walking perfect, dying innocent, and paying with my perfect blood. I'm going to find a bride and test the hearts. I'm going to offer the cup. Then I'm going to sound the alarm, make the judgment, and then I'll dwell among them. But he said, at year 4,000 is when I'm going to do the first part of my plan. So, he had Israel after 2,500, listen to this, after 2,525 years. Does that sound familiar, Mr. Bone? Oh, wait, uh, 2,520 is the number of days in seven years of 360. What's the deal with that? God loves his numbers and God is perfection and everything is done at a perfect time and timing even if we don't understand it. But we're starting to. We've been learning more. He's ordered our steps through his word that we can see more finally. So yeah, 2,525 years into the creation of man after the flood of destruction. Now. He's called out Abraham, who had Isaac, who had Jacob, who had the 12. And from the tribe of Levi, he had Moses. So in the year 2525 from creation, he calls Moses out and he sends him to Israel or uh, Egypt to bring his people out. And as he brings them out, he's going to bring them out with his appointments He's going to bring them out with the first appointment, bring them to his mountain at the exact next appointment, and then he's going to offer the I do cup, which 
they will take or not. And then the rest of the story. So, if you do the math, the Exodus was in 1446 or 47. Jesus would come in the 4,000th year, which we've identified as 31 AD. 1447 plus 31 AD, that is 1,477 years. Remember when you go from, from BC to AD, you always got to subtract one year. 1,477 years, he told Moses, I want you to practice these feasts. These are my feasts. These are my appointments with mankind that I'm going to do. So God already had the plan. Then he created the feast for them to practice and they would practice, so the save mankind, walk perfect, die innocent, pay with perfect blood. What feast was it, Mr. Bones? Hey, this sounds like Passover. You are correct, sir. And he chose to die a cruel torturous death, to be torn apart, ripped to shreds, beat, spit upon, laughed at, hit with sticks and his hair pulled out and hung on a cross, pierced in his hands and his feet and bleeding out all that perfect blood from God. The blood only comes from the Father. So his virgin birth allowed God's perfect sinless blood to walk in a man's body for 33 years for him to spill it perfectly, paying for all the sins of all of mankind, so that anyone who would choose to drink the cup, that price was put to their ledger and they became sinless. They became made righteous. He who knew no sin became sin so that we who knew no righteousness could become the righteousness of God in Christ by his blood, by us drinking the cup that he offered. Here's this cup of wine. Drink it. Guess what it is, Mr. Bones? Oh, it's the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. Very important. That is the critical part. So he started with his Passover and he would be torn apart, walking innocent. He said, I'm going to choose to have them bring a lamb into their house and keep it for four days and kill it at twilight because I will come perfectly innocent, sinless, blameless, and walk for 4,000 years or God will manage earth for 4,000 years before he comes to do that. So he said, I want them to practice with a lamb because that'll be a picture of me. Now, when Israel was practicing this, Mr. Bones, and the other things we're going to talk about, they didn't really get what it was. Oh, yeah, they just thought this was the ritual that we follow. Exactly. But we, looking back after the cross, see the lamb was perfect. An innocent lamb, beautiful, lovely, loving and it breaks your heart to do the slaughter. And when they would uh, kill the lamb, they would also cut it right down the middle and, and hang the legs straight out like that. So it was just like him on the cross. Then he said, because I'm going to be beaten with whips and hooks that rip out my flesh, I'm going to also have them make bread. But this is going to be unleavened bread, very lowly, very humble, not glorious, not wonderfully delicious. This is like a, a cracker. And I'm going to make it out of the lowliest grain, barley, which is animal food. So he would have them make this barley flatbread with no leaven to puff it up. And it would be pierced like he was pierced. And it would be striped because of the burn marks of being put into the oven. And it would come out after being in the fire, just like he would go into the fire. 
and then they would break that bread and that's all they would eat for that whole week showing his sinless humble nature and then he would have the high priest wave the lowly barley the least of the desired plants the barley plant and that's how he would come at his passover and he called it passover because he knew death was appointed to all man that satan owned them but he would pass them over from this world into the supernatural another frequency another realm which is heaven right above us we would pass over the death angel would pass over us because we had the blood just like he taught them put the blood on the door and when the death angel comes to kill all the firstborn of the land i will see the blood on your door when he sees the blood on our door he doesn't go in the house to examine if it's good enough the blood is what's good enough the blood makes you perfect so he had them practice this for 1477 years what a perfect god number 1400 is two times seven and then seven seven so it's like seven 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 how absolutely perfect before he would fulfill it on the cross so the old saying mr bones oh uh, jesus fulfilled passover on passover and unleavened bread on unleavened bread and first fruits on first fruits and then they mistakenly think uh shabbat is pentecost and yada 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 we're going to explain that you're going to get it this time but mr bones uh what's wrong with that well actually they were practicing what he was going to do so he had the plan first and they were fulfilling his work exactly it was god's plan from the beginning so for 1477 years they were practicing his work of salvation whether they understood some of it or not that was the passover then the next step that's the price so now he's going to look for a bride so he walks them seven complete sabbaths and the sabbaths are by the moon just like his passover was by the moon his appointments were by the moon he can't use saturdays and sundays that weren't even invented yet and he can't use just simple continual count that would change every single month and every single year because he was going to do this perfect work in the 4000th year and so he was having them practice exactly what he was going to do now there's only one way he could have them practice it perfectly every time if it was by the sun moon and stars he said i created the sun moon and stars the greater light and the lesser light they shall be for signs and for my holy appointments it's called seasons in the english bible the hebrew is moedim which means my appointments with mankind we know his appointments save mankind find a bride offer the cup sound the warning judgment day those are his appointments that he said he would do at the 4000th year and then at the 6000th year and then from 7 and on so he said i'm going to have you use the sun moon and stars so every time you practice it'll be perfect in psalm 104 verse 19 he said i appointed the moon for seasons the sun knoweth his going down so the moon appoints the appointed time the word again moedim my appointments with mankind the moon appoints the days the moon appoints my appointments we know that israel came along adopted saturday sunday monday from the babylonians and they followed that and they started calling their sabbath friday night into saturday that was their error but god instructed moses in the wilderness use the sun moon and stars so if i told you mr bones all right i give you the sun moon and stars now start telling time what would you do uh, well i would uh, observe the sun moon and stars and i would see what they did 
What would be the first thing you notice? Uh, well, the moon goes away. And then it comes back as a sliver and grows to half, then full, then starts to go away again. So that's, that would be my count of a moonth. I would call it a moonth. It's <laughs> a good idea. Well, what else would you notice? Uh, the sun seems to move through the constellations. So I would start to tell time by where the sun was in which constellation. There you go. There's only one way that you could use the sun, moon, and stars. I'll give you the sun, moon, and stars right now. Go figure out a counting system. There's only one way. The only thing you would need to know is which constellation the sun and moon should start in to start your year. Well, God gave us the information right in his word. He said, start your year in the month Abib. So there's a star named Abib. It was always called Abib until recently when man changed it to Spica. And it's a branch of barley. Wow, isn't that neat? convenient. Well, should we start the year looking for the barley when the sun is in a beam? No, that's the fall. So on the other side, when the sun is in the lamb, when the Lord said, take to you a baby lamb, we see the new moon sliver at sunset. The new moon will be highlighting Aries, the lamb, and over on the other horizon is the star Spica Abib on the horizon, three witnesses, so that every single year you can start your year according to what God said. It's the only way without using calculations or shadows through, you know, uh, Stonehenge and, and these structures where they were looking for the equinox and the, and the equilux and everything. You could see, anybody could see the sun, moon, and stars. Okay? So he said, Start your year like that, and then follow my pattern of seven complete Sabbaths using the moon, and a moon will go through a Sabbath will be a half moon, and then a full moon, and then the other half, and the waning crescent, and then it goes away for a couple of days. And that was known as the new moon festival. So he said, now I'm going to find a bride. I'm going to see if they're interested in me, if they will walk and follow me. So what feast was that? Testing of hearts, harvesting of souls. Shavuot. This is when God descended on the mount and he said to Moses, go ask them if they will, if they're interested. Ask them if they like me, if they would want to be my special people and I'll be their special God. And so Moses went to inquire. But that wasn't the marriage. That was not the marriage. Just like in a Hebrew marriage, there's an inquiry first. Are you interested? Might you? Then what would happen is the father and the son, the would-be bridegroom, would go to the bride's house and knock on the door. Oh, that sounds like in the book of Revelation with uh, Church of Laodicea. I stand at the door knocking. It's exactly what it was a reference to. I stand at the door knocking. Anybody who will open, with, open to me, I will come in and sup with them. So there was already inquiry. So they knew when the father and the groom came to knock on the door, they already knew whether they were going to open it. If they didn't, the groom and the son knew it was a no-go. So they went back home. But if they opened the door, they would go in and sup with them. And this is when they would bring the marriage ketubah, the covenant, all the what I will do and what you will do, what is expected of you. Do you want to do this? Then they would drink the cup and then it would be a real marriage. But it wasn't in the inquiry phase. That was Shabbat where they inquired, would you? Then, as we saw in the book of Exodus, God called Moses back up. And 70 elders, pay attention to that. So after Shavuot, he fulfilled Shavuot and did the feast offerings, of burnt offerings, peace offerings, ate and drank. They read the words that they had so far, and Moses sprinkled blood on the people. Okay? This was the 
inquiry of the proposal. Then he called Moses up. It was a testing period of faithfulness. And he was going to bring down at the feast of new wine, he was going to bring down the marriage covenant and ask if you want to drink the cup. So this is the true Pentecost. New wine. They came down seven complete Sabbaths after seven complete Sabbaths. There's your 50 counts. And he was bringing down the ketubah and they were going to drink the wine cup and it would have been the official marriage. But what happened? Mr. Bones, what happened? Well, there was rebellion in the camp and many lost faith and they demanded a golden calf be built to worship. And then Aaron said, tomorrow is a feast unto Yahweh. Now I've heard a couple of people say that was just a made up feast or something. That is, that's maybe one of the silliest things I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> Do you remember Aaron's sons brought in strange fire into the tabernacle and they were struck dead instantly for doing it wrong? You can't mess around Aaron being second only to Moses. The high priest of Israel, you can't mess around and make up a feast and lie like that. No, this was an official feast that God already had planned. And some of them knew about it. They didn't fully understand it, but they knew it was a feast time. And they brought burnt offerings and peace offerings, and they gathered together to celebrate as you do on God's appointed times. Okay, but because of the golden calf, they came down and Moses representing the father and Joshua representing the son, Jesus, Yahshua, came down with the marriage covenant. There was adultery. If the father and the groom come to the bride's house and find out there was already adultery with another man, again, because the inquiry is the first step of the process. So they were engaged, so to speak, the engagement. If there was messing around with another man, they would smash the ketubah on the ground and destroy it. So what did Moses do? Smash the ketubah, the Ten Commandments, on the ground, exactly what you would do. And then to certify that it was unfaithful or adultery, they burn up the calf and put it into the water and had Israel drink. And all who were guilty, their bellies swell and their thigh began to rot. This comes from Numbers 5. You can read about it, the test for adultery. If you read the law, then when you hear certain stories that you don't quite understand, the law, I understand. But it's for all scripture is profitable for us and for doctrine and for understanding. So it's not all for us, but it's profitable. So if you read the unpopular stuff, you will find out there's explanation to a lot of things you didn't understand. So you, you probably have wondered, why did he burn up the calf and make him drink it? That's gross. But it was an adultery test. And that's how they knew who to slay. And Mr. Bones, shing, how many did they slay? 3,000 died. Stab, stab. How'd they know who to stab? They went after the ones that were guilty because they were all blowed up. That 3,000 dying is critical because that's going to be a clue to God's future covenant. Everything in the new covenant must be seen in the old covenant. Mr. Bones, a, a covenant is like a will and testament. Oh, yeah, like uh, my last will and testament is where I decide who gets the stuff. Exactly. So if he had an old covenant, when he writes a new covenant, it's like if your ancestor rewrites their will and maybe you're out of the will. <laughs> so you have to pay attention to what was and then the changes of the new covenant. And the new covenant, some people are going to be left out. So... He says he was going to bring down the wine cup of marriage. It would have been I do, but they, he brought instead the wine cup of wrath. 
and they drank of wrath. And then God said, I will rise up in a moment and smote these people. How long will I put up with their stiff-necked and stubbornness? I will destroy them and make a new people out of you, Moses. And Moses said, wait, wait, wait. No, please. Uh, let me come up and make atonement for them. And uh, if not, you know, blot me out of your book. In other words, play in the part of Jesus. I will die for them, for, the, for their forgiveness. So, the wine cup was the feast of new wine. That is the true Pentecost. So, Israel, when they walked through the wilderness, they blew it. And the wine cup was taken back. They got the cup of wrath instead. In the new covenant, we will see that the Gentile church, God's church, his new ecclesia, they were the ones that got the wine cup and they drank it and said, yes, Israel still has blinders on until the fullness of the new bride is fulfilled. The, fil the fullness of the Gentiles is the new cup. So when people say, well, I don't see the Feast of Wine in, in Leviticus 23. Yeah, because it was withheld from them. They rejected him. They were an adulterous wife. So it's not for them. But it was a secret feast that was always there. You have to explain what was the feast when Moses came down seven complete Sabbaths later in the month of Av and smashed the marriage covenant. You have to explain that if you if you deny it but all of us can see it once you see this you can't unsee it the wine is the new covenant israel didn't get the new covenant but they'll have another chance so then god says i'm gonna sound the alarm this one should be pretty easy trumpets and then the testing period is the days of earth known as the days of awe, where the books of life and death and in between are opened and God is examining the life and seeing if they will choose him and drink that cup. And everybody who rejects him, the books will be closed on Mr. Bones, Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur, Judgment Day. The books will be closed. And then, after the decision is made, at the end, he will tabernacle with mankind, and that will fulfill Sukkot. And then the new beginning, let me write this in blue. Hanukkah, where he rededicates the new temple and we live with God and reign with him a thousand years. Okay, so God had the plan first. He said, this is what I'm going to do. Now I'm going to teach mankind through Moses and Israel first. I'm going to teach them to do appointments with, with the word is mikra. Kodesh. Mikra is a, uh, a dress rehearsal. Kodesh is holy. So it's like a holy dress rehearsal of his Moedim, my appointments. Okay, I want you to holy dress rehearsal my appointments. So on Passover, they slaughter a lamb, unleavened bread, offer barley. At the Feast of Shavuot, which is his finding a bride he offers the first fruit of the wheat that means he can harvest the wheat he offers two leaven loaves as he's collecting souls and testing hearts to build loaves of bread and two baby lambs but he reminds them i will be the sin offering the goat that is offered for a sin offering and i'll also be burnt with fire 
the bull, the two rams, and the seven lambs, completely consumed in fire, representing his descent into death and hell. But his goal is to bring out some wheat, harvest the wheat, separate it from the tares, and make loaves of bread like a family. Wheat has the extra information in, in, in the way it grows. When it grows with tares, the tares look exactly like the wheat. But only when the wheat matures and fills with the fruit and the nutrition, it bows down. But the tares who are empty and have no substance, they stand straight up. So the harvest is the end of the world. But again, the way he created the rules, if he is not the first fruit of the, of the wheat, he can't harvest the wheat. So he could never make his family. So Shavuot is his looking for the bride. Then he would come down and he would offer the wine cup. Okay, so when he offered the cup, he prophesied that there would come a day when he would pour out wine upon the earth. And this was a representation of all those who would drink of his wine, which is the blood of the new covenant. So just like our thumbnail to start out, he poured wine, the Holy Spirit, from heaven onto the earth as he instructed Israel to practice for 1,477 years before he would do it on the true Pentecost. This is the true Pentecost. Shavuot was the Shavuot in the which Jesus ascended on that day. He was literally, the word is taken up and offered as a sacrifice. So he would be the first fruit and the goat and all the other animals. Then for those who would by free will drink of that cup, he would pour out his Holy Spirit. So when we say, I do, we hear about the payment he made. We hear about the offer of marriage and he says, will you? And we say, I do. And he pours out his Holy Spirit, which changes us. And we become part of him. And at that point, we're considered married. Now, in a Jewish wedding, they would, from that point on, put on a veil. After they drank the cup, they would put on a veil. And that would tell everybody around, everybody that saw her, that she was taken. She was already married. So, do you wear a veil that says, I'm already married. So, you still have a chance to show the world, live out loud, wear your veil, so to speak. That, which is also by being separate and set apart and holy, looking for him. But don't, don't miss a chance to let people know who your allegiance is with and to love them and love people and be seen of men doing good for your father because that is part of drawing people into the kingdom. But you say, yeah, I do. Now I have the Holy Spirit working with me because I drank that cup and that's what communion is all about. So now we're looking at the end of the world is going to be sound the alarm with trumpets. The seven days of awe will turn into the seven years of tribulation. And the judgment day will be at the end of the 6,000 years. So we know tribulation will start with trumpets. The seven days will turn into seven years and it will end with Yom Kippur which will also be a Jubilee year, which will also fulfill trumpets and Yom Kippur at the same time. Then after he's back on earth, after he's done his work, then he will gather everybody together and we will tabernacle with him and he will bring down the new temple. Okay?
So that is God's plan. He had it from the beginning. So when people say, well, I'm not sure if rapture will happen at an appointed time, getting his bride was the number one plan. The number one goal of his eternal plan was, I'm going to get a bride. Because when he spoke of Adam, it's not good for man to be alone. He also said, I want bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh to be one with me. He was searching for a bride that would accept the price paid, that would be willing to choose him, and then walk faithfully with him to drink the cup. Okay? So, this is why we believe, Mr. Bones, that the uh, rapture could very well happen at the Feast of New Wine, which was the true Pentecost in the book of Acts, when you read about the, the Feast of Pentecost, the day of Pentecost that had fully come, Jesus arose on Shavuot to fulfill Shavuot because it was his appointment. He walked with them, testing hearts and instructing how to harvest souls. So he went up to fulfill Shavuot. It was his appointed time. He didn't go 10 days early. Then they walked faithfully, unlike what Israel did, during the time Moses was up to bring the cup and the ketubah, Israel failed. And that's why the Feast of Wine was taken away from them. Incidentally, wine in Hebrew is yayin, has the value of 70. The word for secret in Hebrew is sod, and it has the value of 70. After Shavuot, God asked Moses, bring up 70 elders to eat at the foot of the mountain. He was hinting already towards the 70 and the 70 and the 70 secrets. So this was a secret feast, so to speak, previously unknown, but in the last days he promised, I will open the books and many will run to and fro and knowledge of my purpose and truth will come evident in the last generation that it wasn't before. So that is what we see with this Feast of New Wine. And for those that still want to deny there's a Feast of Wine, again, everything in the New Testament, the New Covenant, must be seen in the Old Covenant. Because God said, I am God, there is none like me. I declare the end from the beginning. So where did he declare the new cup? if he didn't declare it at the beginning. I'm going to take this down. Excuse me, Mr. Bow. Oh, don't mind me. All right, can everybody see this? God said everything that is in the Bible, in his word, from Moses and the prophets must be fulfilled. So he had Moses walk out his plan. So he brought them out with blood on the door. He left Egypt representing us leaving the world. Egypt represents the world. He brought them through the Red Sea, representing us going through the separation between earth and heaven, the third heaven with God. And then we would walk seven complete Sabbaths to the Shabbat, will you? We say, yes, we will. Tell us the details. He calls Moses back up, and that is where God went back up. So we see Jesus. Can you see those? Okay. Jesus, blood on the door, fulfilled the lamb that he had them practice. He was put into the earth. He tore the veil. He rose again like that first fruit of barley. And then he went up to heaven to present the blood, but came back down and walked with them just as Moses walked with them after going through the Red Sea, seven complete Sabbaths. Only by using the moon can you have perfect, complete Sabbaths every time. If you count Saturdays and Sundays, then it'll be a different date every single month every single year. It'll be a different date. Now, 
you may not know this, but God is observing these days in heaven. All of the days we do on earth, there is observance in heaven. So anybody who thinks God is using Saturday and Sunday in heaven, raise your hand. Mr. Bones, I don't see anybody. Uh, I, I don't think anybody would fall for that one. So there's only one way to make it perfect. Use the moon. And by using the moon, there's one more complete Sabbath. This is where everybody gets confused. They want to count 50 straight days. That's not how God works. He counts moon cycles. That's why a Hebrew year is 354 days. Where are those extra days? Those aren't counted in a 365 year that is a solar year. God uses a reset method. So there's one more complete Sabbath in Nisan, four in the second month, and two in the third month, bringing us to a full moon. The word for full moon is kase, and the word for throne is kase, spelled slightly different, but that's God's way of tying those two together. The four layers of Hebrew understanding teach us how to do things like that, where you just read something, you're not going to get it. You're grazing the grass just right on the surface. But when you understand how words are tied together, how his precept is upon precept, how his appointments dictated the feast cycle, then you start to be on the eagle level, which is deeper, even though the eagles soar on high. Okay, so seven complete Sabbaths, it's a, it's a testing period too. And then from Shavuot, the Lord descended on the mount, gave com commandments, and then went back up. With Jesus, he brought them out to the Mount of Olives. If you're only reading he walked with them 40 days, you forgot about when he showed himself and then disappeared and then showed himself again and said, touch my hand. And then he disappeared again for eight days. You didn't count those eight days. Add those two days to the eight days to the 40 days, and now you're bringing up to the true Pentecost. Again, you can't just graze on a single verse and then make your doctrine if you want to be a Berean. But that walk for seven represented this testing period where Israel failed and brought out the golden calf. For the church, the 120 and 120 is the number of the church. The 120 were in the upper room. They were faithfully waiting as he said, wait, go to Jerusalem and wait. If it was Shavuot, he wouldn't have had to say to wait because they would have had to be there. But he said, go to Jerusalem and wait and I will send the gift. This was the cup of wine he poured from heaven. And then he had a witness stand up and say, these people are drunk on new wine. And it was the time of the new wine, but Peter didn't deny drinking. He said, we're not drunk. It's only the third hour, which is 9 a.m., which is when the high priest is consecrating the wine to be drunk. There are many great videos out there. I, uh, I meant to mention this at the beginning. Our brother Tyler Generation, uh, his, his last name is actually Generation. I think his middle name is 2434. Oh, I, I didn't even know that. Yeah, and uh, uh, he, <laughs> my brother Tyler, has done many great videos on the Feast of New Wine Pentecost. And uh, recently, our brother, uh, Pastor Jimmy Root, uh, Jimmy the Root, uh, did a, a fantastic video that I posted on my community page. And then our sister, um, uh, Carol Vay, Carol Vay did an excellent video where, where a lot of scriptural backing of everything I've said. And then of course, last year we did about 12 videos, so you can look into those. So I'm trying to give you the big picture here. All right. But this has been well documented by, by people who study and understand study to show yourself approved a watchman that need not be ashamed. I think uh, uh, some people may, may feel a little sheepish when they get up to heaven and, and God goes through this. They'll be like, well, yeah, I thought it was there too. <laughs> okay, so that was a testing period. They passed the test. They got the Holy Spirit and 3,000 were saved, bringing us right back to the 3,000 that were killed at the foot of the mountain. And that's how God ties things together. 
not coincidence. Everything he does is with specific intent. So that launched the church, those feasts, and then he will end with, where did I put my other one? The end of the world will be started with a seven year period that will start with the alarm of judgment. Then the seven days will turn into seven years. Judgment day is the final separation. Then he will come and dwell with them and start a new beginning. Okay, so is that clear? God had the appointments first. He had man practice those appointments for 1,477 years. And now we've been practicing for another 1,994 years. And there will be seven more years added to complete the time of practice where God says, now it is completely fulfilled my plan of salvation. All right. Now, I want to show you, uh, I, I, I taught on this a little bit before, but we've, we've cleaned it up and added a few things. So give me a moment. All right, Mr. Bones, what do you think so far? Oh, I'm uh, really loving it. I think you're explaining it in a way that people never saw before. It's causing a paradigm shift. Ooh, how, how awesome. Mr. Bones, this is something that I think, if people were aware of, would really open the eyes of why this month of Av is so important. So throughout the scriptures, and, and this is not a complete exhaustive list by any means, but throughout the scriptures, there is reference back to the month of Av and especially around the ninth of Av, almost in every single book of the Bible. But specifically, we're going to go with some of the big ones that really shout out, almost like screaming, this is the Gentile feast. Look at this Gentile picture. Okay. But as we know, what's coming is a great and terrible day. So it's going to be great for us who are raptured up to heaven to be with our Lord and Savior. And there we will be forever. And it's going to be a terrible day, a day of darkness and gloominess when everybody else is left behind. And then the worst time on earth starts and gets worse and worse and worse and worse and worse till the end. Okay. So what we have, again, these are specifically scripturally targeted to can be proven, verified that it's talking about the month of Av. Okay. And again, most, most of them specifically the ninth of Av, eighth, ninth, and 10th. Okay. So again, just to be clear, Pentecost, the day of Pentecost, seven complete Sabbaths would bring you to the seventh day of Av, of Av. And the morrow after would be the eighth day when they came out of the promised land after spying it, Joshua and Caleb had a big giant bundle of grapes between them representing our Lord Jesus Christ hung in between two thieves. And that was when they gave a good report was on the eighth of Av. That would be the true day of new wine of Pentecost. As that day turned into evening, it became the ninth of Av because for, for Israel, for the Hebrew uh, count, the day starts at evening. So when it became evening, it says in the scripture, they gave the evil report. Okay, so that's why we say eighth of Av, ninth of Av, and then as the ninth finished, it turned into the tenth of Av. Okay, but that's all targeting the same time. So, shing, come with me. In the book of Genesis, the first prophecy we have, and remember, God declares the end from the beginning. He has Noah, can you see that up there? just a little bit above. He has Noah, after they've been through the flood, he causes a wind to pass over on Passover. The mountain, the ark comes to rest on the mountains of Ararat, which means reverse the curse, on the 17th day of what was the first month, back then called the seventh. But on 117, resurrection day, the curse was reversed, just like it would be in the future. Prophecy. Okay, then he gives us the exact count to get to the ninth and 10th of Av and Noah opens the door of the ark and he lets out the dove and the raven 
and we'll go over that. But what is he declaring there? We obviously know, Mr. Bones, what does the dove represent? Hey, that's the Holy Spirit. And who do you think the raven is? Hey, that would be Ha Satan. Exactly. So we, we, we know the players. And God says on the ninth of Av, this incredible famous day where things keep happening for thousands of years to Israel, starting with that golden calf. And then followed the very next year by the evil report. God already knew they were going to do that back with Noah. He opened the door, ninth of Av, let's go a raven, representing Satan. He goes to and fro and never comes back. It's because a raven could sit on floating debris and eat dead stuff. And so that's what he did. But the dove, who is pure, was going to eat fresh. So the dove came right back. So we see... Specifically, the dove representing the Holy Spirit went out just like the Lord poured the Holy Spirit into the world and the Holy Spirit has been gathering bride and growing in the Holy Spirit filled church and then the Holy Spirit will be pulled back in and the scripture says Noah and his name means rest but his name backwards means grace. So Grace pulled the dove, Holy Spirit, in by the sole of her foot. So all that symbolism representing Jesus is one day going to pull the Holy Spirit-filled church in by our souls. Okay? On the ninth of Av, and then held them for seven. Then, seven days later, so again, ninth and tenth, on the seventeenth, he would release the dove again. And the dove would bring back an olive leaf representing peace with Israel. So we are going to be raptured in heaven for seven years, and then Israel will have peace at the end of the seven. He declares the end from the beginning. Beginning, The church got the dove, Israel got the raven. In the month of Av, which Av is the word for father, Abba, uh, um, the bet can be either a V sound or a B sound. That's why. And then this is the picture of the number five, the fifth month, the month of Av, the spirit. And we have been teaching for three, going on four years, that the Holy Spirit was poured out in the month of Av. And we, we just have evidence upon evidence upon evidence. You'll catch on. It's okay. You know, people want to hang on to their old tradition. Remember the, the number of tradition, Mr. Bounds? Oh yeah, 666. Makes me really leery of tradition. It's a smart position to have. Okay? So, church, the dove on 9th of Av. They got the raven. Grace opens the door on the 9th of Av. The door of grace is shut. After the dove came back, the door of grace was shut. Pulled in for seven years, olive leaf after seven years. So we see this one story is talking about the church and Israel. Now, after the flood, Noah plants a vineyard. Again, people don't read all of the book or the law, so they don't know what Ham did. But it's right there in, I think I have it written, Leviticus 20, 11. If a man sleeps with his father's wife, it is said to that he has uncovered his nakedness. So when Ham discovered Noah naked, he discovered his wife naked. And Ham raped Noah's wife, which may or may not have been his mother. And so they would produce an offspring called Canaan, and that's why Noah cursed Canaan. But again, while Noah was drunk on new wine, which is a good thing, a celebration, Ham, representing the Antichrist, rapes his wife, and the wife and Noah representing God, the wife representing Israel, when we are taken up at the Feast of New Wine, and God is merry with new wine with his new bride, Israel will be, will be being accosted by Satan. See the deeper story underneath the story? That's digging eagle level deep. Okay? 
In Exodus, again, he was offering the wine cup of marriage, but instead they got the wine cup of wrath. And Numbers 5 is where he explained that law of why you drink ashes from the temple. Okay? So from that disobedience, both of the golden calf and then later the, the evil report, they would be cursed on every ninth of Ab. They would dig their own graves. Again, all the men of war would die. God says, you will walk in this wilderness for 40 years. None of you will see my promised land. So every ninth of Av, they would lay in their graves, and then 15,000 of them would die. So every tenth of Av, after it was over, all the ones that didn't die would rise up out of their graves. So what are we going to see? Can you see Mr. Bones' shirt here? Oh, hey, hello. <laughs> Watch your hands there, buddy. <laughs> Sorry, I want them to see. This is them rising from their graves. This is what happened at every ninth of Av because for 40 years they would dig their own graves. All the men of war, the, the, the men above a certain age, would lie in their graves. But only 15,000 would die each year. Again, we had 6 million men. So over the 40 years, there was always 15,000 died. But everybody else would rise up out of their graves. Just like that on the ninth of Av. Wow, what, what an incredible typology. And then 15,000 would die on the ninth of Av. All right, in the book of Numbers, Moses had them spy out the land for 40 days. So they were in the promised land. Now, this is the future Israel and the future Jerusalem. So here he says, stay in the promised land for 40 days and check it out. When Jesus rose up on Shabbat, he told them, go to Jerusalem and wait. They would end up waiting 50 full days to the day of Pentecost fully come. So if they would have been faithful, they came out on the 8th and 9th of Av. If they would have been faithful, they would have entered into the land right then on the 8th of Av. But they gave an evil report that evening, turning into the 9th. And so they were cursed to walk the wilderness in the desert for 40 years. When he says, go to Jerusalem and stay there, they waited 50 full days. The, day, the 50th day had fully come, the day of Pentecost. They were faithful, and God poured out the wine cup of I do. And they said, I do, and birthed the church. Now, it is God's nature to do self-same day. You'll find it over and over that the self-same day they went in was the self-same day he brought them out. So what a day for the rapture, the self-same day almost 2,000 years later, that he brings us out. And when a, um, uh, a Hebrew wedding, when the groom and the groom's father would offer the cup to the bride, when she drank the cup, it was an I do, he would say, now I go away to my father's house to build a place for us, and then I will come back and get you and take you to be with me, and you'll be with me forever. And he would say, if anybody asked him, when are you going back to get your bride? Nobody knows the day or the hour except for my father. But everybody knew it was about exactly a year later at the same time as the engagement. It might be a day or two off. And of course, this was depending on the woman's cycle because she couldn't be on her cycle for the wedding because the wedding involved going into the bedchamber and consummating the wedding for seven days with the hopes of getting pregnant instantly. That was the joy and the, the great success of a, of a consummation of a wedding was if they got pregnant by it. Completely different than you know how we are in, in America. Was like, I'm gonna wait and I'm, I don't wanna get uh, pregnant right away. I wanna live my life. Now, that's, this was opposite culture, okay? But they wanted to come back at that same month and everybody wanted to get married around the time of wine because they want wine for the marriage. So knowing her cycle meant that both the bride and the bride's father and the groom's father knew a lot about the time. And did you catch that? The bride knew that it wouldn't be during her cycle, but it was about the same month. And after her cycle, she was unclean for seven days, which means that it would be about 14 days that it couldn't be. So this is, this is what we're doing. We're like, well, 
we feel like it won't be Shavuot because that is, you know, the introduction of the marriage. We became the I do bride at the cup of wine. We think it'll be around that. So you see how we're doing exactly what the bride back then would have done. Okay, so that following year, when they came out and gave the good report, they would have gone into the land, they would have entered the promised land by the grapes. God was showing by the blood of the grapes between two thieves, that is how I'm going to bring you into the promised land. Now, what do you make with the blood of grapes, Mr. Bone? Hey, I think you make new wine. That is why we think new wine is a great time for the rapture. Okay, but they gave, they had fear, they gave an evil report, and so they were cursed. And Joshua, after the 40 years was up, and after entering into and surrounding Jericho, then they would fight battles for seven full years around the promised land. And then after seven years, Caleb, the Gentile, would get his land awarded first because he gave the good report. And he said, this self-same day, I am now 85 years old, which is his age plus the 40 years they walked plus seven more. He said, this self-same day that I gave a good report, the Lord said to me, I would, or Lord told Moses, I would get this land. So Caleb actually entered in and got his land, which was Hebron, on the 8th and 9th of Av. And after all the adults of Israel, the uh, men of war, died, the children entered in and they would get their land awarded to them too. But the Gentile did first, but specifically from the day of the curse, when the Lord said, in a moment, I will rise up and smote them. In a moment, I also will bring them into the land. In a moment, I will choose a foolish nation. All of that surrounding around the 8th and 9th of Av. So I jumped ahead of myself. <laughs> Exodus 33, 5, the first use of in a moment. And this is after the evil report. It's on the 9th of Av. God is really mad. They've provoked me to great anger. And from that point on, when he references back to it, he calls it the great provocation. Remember that time when I was going to bring you into the land and you wouldn't even trust me after all I did, after all I've done. He says, in a moment. So that was spoken on the 9th of Av. Then there's 13 uses of that phrase, in a moment, in the whole Bible. The very last use of it is in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump in 1 Corinthians 15, 52, where he transforms our body and raptures us up. So again, the curse was, none of you are going to go into my promised land. You're all going to walk around and die. But in a moment, I will rise up and start this. And in a moment, I will take my Gentile bride into the promised land and you will be cast out. So he will rise up and smote Israel and they will go through kind of a reverse of Joshua where he gets the promised land at the end. We will get the promised land, the Gentile, and then they will go through seven years of war, the seven year tribulation. In Deuteronomy 32, 21, Again, this is God's promise about the ninth of Av. I will choose a foolish nation on that day that they provoked me to jealousy. Don't you think this is incredible that all of these prophecies are about the ninth of Av? Ruth, the Gentile bride, she got married after the full barley harvest and after the full wheat harvest, which Mr. Bones, what comes after the full barley harvest and the full wheat harvest? Oh, that's the feast of new wine. So she got married exactly a Gentile bride at the feast of new wine, which would have been in the month of Av, I believe exactly on the 8th of Av. And Israel was an adulterous wife put away. In Esther, she has the banquet of wine. So this not necessarily in the month of Av, but the banquet of wine is constantly a typology of the Feast of New Wine. And what do we see in that story? Haman, which is Ham, man, go back up here. Ham rapes Noah's wife, 
representing the Antichrist, accosting Israel, Ham man assaults Esther. So they're at the banquet of wine, and Esther's like, he's the bad guy. And the king goes out, and the uh, Haman, Hamon, <laughs> It's like he falls on her bed to beg for mercy and the king comes back and he's like, it looks like he's trying to force his way with her. And that was, of course, the typology. Again, that's how God says run to and fro and tie these things together. In the Song of Songs, it says, my, my beloved, he comes. He come away, my love, my dove, my fair one, come away. He took me to the banqueting house, but in, in Hebrew, it's actually yayin, the word for wine. So when he takes her away, he takes her to the wine house. After the flood, the first story is Noah with the vineyard, with the wine, with celebration. And then the Antichrist rises. We will be taken up and the first thing he says, I won't drink again of this cup till I drink it new with you in heaven. And he says, nobody puts new wine in old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the wineskins. Well, that is speaking of the new covenant. The covenant in his blood is by grace through faith in his work. Nobody puts the new covenant back in the old covenant. And say, well, yeah, you're saved by grace, but you have to follow the old covenant laws. Otherwise, you lose your salvation. Well, you just burst the wineskin and spilled everything and you lost everything. You can't mix old covenant law with new covenant grace. The new wine is the new covenant. The cup of his blood is he is your sanctification, your righteousness your holiness, your kodesh, your pure white robe, your gold in the fire of earth. You are in him like we be in the ark and the ark door is shut. We are in the house and blood's on the door. Okay, so it's only about Jesus's blood and that new covenant. So when he brings us up, it'll like we are like new wine that bursts this old wine skin. And the first thing we are told will happen is a celebration where he drinks new wine with us. And just like the story of Noah, while God is celebrating with his bride, Israel will be going through trouble. From Ham, the Antichrist. I think his name is going to be Ham. In the book of Judges, Samson pushes the pillars out. The word for pillar in Hebrew is 120, and in Greek it's 1200. Both of those speak of the church. So when Samson, which is Jesus, pushes out the church, the pillars, 3,000 will die. When do you think that happened? Mr. Bones? I think that happened at the Feast of New Wine. <laughs> they were all merry with wine when they said, bring him out so we can make sport of him. He was grinding wheat, so obviously it was after the wheat harvest. It was at the time of new wine. In Isaiah 26, it says, we have wrought no deliverance in the earth. We have, as it were, brought forth wind, which sounds like a, a statement of futility. But when you remember the Ruach, it's the breath of God. It's the wind of God. Israel, our mother-in-law, like Ruth, the mother-in-law of the Gentile, or um, uh, Naomi, the mother-in-law of the Gentile Ruth, Israel has brought forth wind. They brought forth the Holy Spirit-filled church. And before she travailed, she brought forth a child. Who has heard such a thing? In the book of Acts, the Ruach HaKodesh was poured out on the 120 in the upper room, poured out like wine on the Feast of New Wine, which was the true day of Pentecost. But for Israel, they got Ha Satan. In the Gospels, the body of Christ came out of the waters, and then the Holy Spirit descended on him like a dove. So the timing of this was exactly in the month of Av because 
Then the story would follow that he went into the wilderness to be tested of the devil for 40 days. So we see the Holy Spirit dove and the raven in the same story. Jesus Christ coming out of the waters. The waters represent people. So Jesus Christ would come out of the waters and then the Holy Spirit would be restored. So he had to walk perfectly innocent and sinless and blameless for the amount of time necessary to pay for Adam's sin. Then he would receive the Holy Spirit, and then he would have to willfully die and be torn apart so that he would have the right to pour that Spirit on his bride, the church. Adam was a living soul. He was body and soul. Jesus came to be a quickening spirit. Quickening means to bring to life. His main goal in the salvation of mankind was to restore the spirit, the Holy Spirit, back to mankind. Because only if you are born again of the spirit can you be in the presence of God. So anybody that is not born again of the spirit, the Holy Spirit, they are still two-thirds of creation, which is 6666666666%. Okay? So he came to restore the spirit. And all we have to do is hear his story, the payment he gave. Listen to the offer of marriage. Be faithful to choose. Yes, I'm going to drink this cup. I choose you forever. And then you get the Holy Spirit. But Israel. He called a brood of vipers. And if you know a little bit about vipers, uh, when they have a brood, when a mother viper has a brood of vipers, they actually eat the mother's body alive. So it was, it was more of a dig. And, and while I'm on this, a fig in Israel, I'm, I'm sure you've all heard the story of the Tola worm, which is uh, that red worm that climbs up on a tree and attaches itself to the tree and it would have its young that will be uh, she knows and once she attaches herself to the tree she'll never coming down just like Jesus attaching himself to that tree and he said I am a Tola worm so this Tola worm was scarlet red and his the babies would be scarlet red but as she died after giving birth her body would then, after three days, turn into a white substance, uh, uh, like a wax, that would go over all the babies and protect them. Though your sins be like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. And then after a while, that, that white waxy stuff flakes off and falls like snow. So when God speaks, he, he really has a lot in what he's bringing forth. So with a fig, you know, Israel's the fig tree generation. In order for a fig to ripen, to be a fruit, it must be pollinated by a little tiny wasp, a female wasp. And this wasp will go into the bottom little opening at the bottom of a fig. You've all seen that little hole at the bottom. And as she climbs in, her wings are taken off and her antenna, that's, that's kind of like a picture of Jesus coming down in his supernatural glory being taken off but she will climb up into that fig and then she will birth many young female and male and then she will die in there and then the males will pollinate the females and then they will dig a little hole out uh, and so all the sisters who are now pregnant can climb out and they'll go to the next fig so Look at that in Jesus. Jesus came to Israel, the fig, and climbed up in them and laid a bunch of eggs, sowing the seed of his word, and then he died in there to bring forth all those that would spread out and pollinate more figs. Isn't that a beautiful story? God has so much more in his word. When you're just reading surface and you're just trying to say, well, this verse says this, you are missing it. Look for the deeper story always, and especially concerning this ninth of Av and the Feast of Av. Why the Feast of New Wine? Why would God put so many stories 
about the ninth of Av, and then of all of the appointed times in, in the scripture, there's one that keeps getting highlighted for Israel throughout the last couple of thousand years, the ninth of Av. Okay, so when Christ walked enough time, he could be baptized and come out of the waters, representing him coming out of the people, the population, and he received the Holy Spirit, and then after his passion on the cross, he would then come back and walk with them and go up at Shavuot and tell them, if you are faithful and go and wait for me, I will pour out this Holy Spirit. And that is where we all get the Holy Spirit, on the Feast of New Wine. 1 Corinthians 6, 12, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So, when we are taken out, the rapture is God calling back the Holy Spirit. The Lord himself shall descend with a shout. So this will be God the Father and God the Son, Jesus, coming back together because they are now in right standing, united together. They will come to the clouds, not all the way to the earth, but they will call up the Holy Spirit, reuniting the union of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the perfect union. Reunited and it feels so good. When we leave, the Holy Spirit leaves, and the temple of the Holy Spirit is figuratively destroyed. So, Mr. Bones, when was the first temple of Israel destroyed? Oh, that was on the 9th of Av. Uh, around the Feast of New Wine, I think. <laughs> yes, it was. Now, when was the second temple destroyed? Oh, that's easy. That was at the 9th of Av. Around the time of the Feast of New Wine. You are exactly right. Now, when will the third temple probably be taken away? Not one stone left upon another. Well, the uh, thinking man would say uh, probably around the ninth above, around the Feast of New Wine. There you go, even Mr. Bones knows. Acts, the New Wine Pentecost, 3,000 were brought to life, everlasting life, to connect to the 3,000 that died at the sin of the golden calf, when Moses and Joshua, the father and son, were bringing down the marriage covenant called the Ketubah, which was the Ten Commandments, and they were bringing down the cup of wine at the Feast of New Wine to drink the new wine, to say I do, but there was adultery. So what do you do with adultery in a marriage? You smash the Ketubah and destroy it. And then if it's if you suspect adultery but you're not sure, you do the test where you have her drink the ashes from the temple. It all happened exactly as the law instructs. His 3,000 brought to life, those 3,000 died. In um, Genesis, we have the story of Eve being brought from Adam's side, his rib pierced on the side, put to sleep. And then in the book of John, after Jesus gives up the ghost, the centurion stabs him in the side and comes forth blood and water, representing his bride. In the Exodus, after the story of the golden calf and uh, Moses has smashed the ketubah, he says, who's on the Lord's side? Come to me. And this is on the 8th and 9th of Av. And he says, come to me. And it's like the bride on the Lord's side. And what is Israel? Well, they're the ones that crucified the Messiah. Finally, Revelation 12 the child is caught up. Now, this, this doesn't necessarily be ninth of Av, but the, the story, you'll see, the child is caught up to heaven, to the throne of God, and Satan is cast down. In Revelation 12, those two things happen simultaneously. Okay? Look at the very first story. The dove is caught up to grace, and the raven is set loose. God declares, Isaiah 46, 9, the end from the beginning. So I got beginning because it's on the good side. The beginning declares the end. So what did God do? What, what, is, what is your thought if, 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 if you're still uh, uh, questioning the Feast of Wine or Av or anything? What is your thought on, on that story? 
Did you know it was the ninth of Av? You can count the days. Of course, you have to, the story in Genesis, you have to switch the months by six. Okay, but then, then you can count it exactly. But when the dove is released and the raven, that's obviously Holy Spirit and Satan. And then we have a story at the end of the book, child caught up, the Holy Spirit child is caught up, the church, and Satan is cast down. So, all of that is to actually get you very excited and show you there's a lot of reasoning behind our thought process. Of course, we don't know for sure, but if I were going to uh, make a choice of my favorite time that I think God was going to rapture us up, it would be when the church began, when he first poured out that wine cup, and he's going to burst our old wineskins and bring us up and drink that new wine and celebrate with him in heaven. That'll be seven complete Sabbaths before the Feast of Trumpets. So again, with, with Noah, he gets on the ark, they're in there for seven days, then the rains start and the fountains of the great deep burst open and it's 40 days and 40 nights of chaos. So add that seven and 40 in a couple of days and that's the same scenario brings us to the Feast of Trumpets. Now out of chaos, the rapture is gonna cause chaos. The earth is gonna give birth. So there's gonna be great earthquakes, maybe hailstones, coals of fire. There's gonna be things crashing and breaking down from all the missing people. Be, there's going to be absolute chaos and people are going to freak out because everybody's going to know somebody that disappeared. And so to have seven and 40 days or seven complete Sabbaths for the Antichrist now to rise up, the hero, the man of the hour, I got the answers, just follow me and sign or strengthen. You see, we already have covenants in place. In fact, they are seven-year covenants heading towards 2030. So he can strengthen the covenant with many, start the great tribulation, again, the seven days of all turn into seven years, and he comes back at the Day of Atonement. That's my story. I'm sticking with it. Mr. Bones, what do you think? Uh, that's my story, too, and uh, I'm glad to be back. Guess who's back? Back again. You are back, and uh, back for good, Mr. Bones. If we do any more... My partner is going to be with me. I hope you all are blessed. I hope you now have a clear picture of the Feast of New Wine. And I have a special guest joining us. It's my lovely wife. <laughs> Hello, my love. That was so good. Oh, you really it liked it? It was very Holy Spirit inspired. Woohoo! Um, I can't wait to watch it again. It That's really my, nice. my number one uh, fan uh, that I, I really always, I always ask if, if my lovely wife likes it, I think I must have done a good job. <laughs> so good job. thank you very much. <laughs> All right, people, we will see you uh, here, there, or in the air. August 13th is the 9th of Ab. So we could go the day before, like the 12th, which would be the 8th of Ab, the true feast of new wine. Mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, at that twinkling of an eye is when the 8th turns into the 9th. So if you want to get specific, I would use Israel as, uh, as their clock's time. So when the sun sets in Israel and the 8th becomes the 9th, um, actually, you know, uh, for, for Israel... We are about seven hours ahead, right? So <laughs> if you're on the East Coast in, in uh, America, we're looking at uh, about 11 a.m. On the, on the 12th or 13th, okay? And the 13th of, of August is my daughter's birthday. So um, we're going to be celebrating the day one way or the other. Um, uh, of course, everybody asks, well, what if it passes? What if it pa Nobody knows the day or the hour. Uh, then we'll look at the Feast of Trumpets. Duh. <laughs> what do you think, Mr. Bone? Yeah, duh. <laughs> All right, because God said I'm going to do it at the appointed times. All right, that's it. That's it. Good job. Bye-bye. Thank you, Lava.